That, that's right. right, yeah. Welcome, everybody, to the stream. We just became live. What's up, everybody? I'm your host, David McCarricker, and today we're joined by the Young Jijikians and Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal, who is today our honorary Young Jijikian. <laughs> Welcome, Cadell. Um, I want to say, I guess, well, I want everyone to be able to kind of introduce themselves, but first I'll just say that, I mean, this is, this is kind of like some of my friends and fellow travelers here, and I'm really excited to have this conversation with you all tonight. I'm also really surprised that Mikey was able to make it. He only has about 50 more minutes to be in the conversation, um, and so we're going to be kind of mostly focusing on talking about Alenka Zupancic and specifically her work, What is Sex? Um, a lot of us are just coming off of some like afterglow or whatever. Like we just got the news that we get to meet Alenka Zupancic uh, because she will be visiting the What is Sex course. And uh, so yeah, we all get to meet one of our heroes. And so I guess I want to hear what you all think about that and anything else that you are thinking about concerning sex, drive, etc. Um, and just each of you maybe take a minute to introduce yourselves and we'll just go, um, just go. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to have to come up with an arbitrary order here. Well, I'll, I'll just jump in and say that I'm, I'm super excited about the What is Sex course. Uh, Dave and I are going to be teaching it now in between May and June. Um, it's a book that has uh, been very close to, to my heart for the last, since it came out, really, like 2018, I picked it up. Um, and I've also had a chance to meet Alenka, but I think it's just an incredible opportunity for the students in the class, not only to get exposure to what I think will be one of the deepest readings and most you know thorough investigations of the book so far, and also to be able to bounce you know, your own idea is off of her live in the class. I'm, I think that's just a fantastic opportunity. So happy to be here and um, great to be with the young Zizekians in general. So it's good to have you. How about we go Andrew, Nick, Mikey. Muted, muted. I muted myself. I thought I was, wasn't was mute on my microphone in. Uh, what's up, everybody? It's Andrew, uh, also known as Big Signorelli, the other half of the Vanishing Mediator channel, formerly known as Kevoy. Um, yeah, I'm excited for the, uh, the What is Sex course. I think that there's nothing like this that's going on right now. Like, even before then, like, nobody was doing anything like as explicitly like with promoting Alenka's work. There, there are no Zupanchians out there. So I think, you know, not only are we Zizekians, but we're also like acolytes of Zupanchian work or the Slovenian school. So it's really rad. And even before that, uh, you know, before really getting into Lacanian psychoanalysis as heavy as I am now and, and Zizek's work, like, you know, I was still getting on to like understanding French theory and stuff like that. And one of the works that I saw on YouTube or projects was of course, Cadell's series on what is sex. And that was very intriguing uh, while I was slowly getting into Zizek. And so like, just to be able to collab with Cadell and then the rest of y'all, it's going to be really exciting and the opportunity to meet Alenka herself. Cause you know, I'm very interested in, in diving into this text more and asking her some stuff on it and then just like tying it in with like other stuff that she's doing that regards psychoanalysis like especially one of the things that she talks about in her essay is like you know like you know why psychoanalysis matters and then her rigorous philosophical inquiry on you know the freudian project the return to freud i think she really emphasizes a lot more on the freudian lacanian project whereas like zizek is very much a hegelian right and he is using lacan but in a different way it's like we get a, like why Freud matters philosophically from Zupanchik than anybody else. And, you know, I think that's quite, you know, intriguing and, and it really shows slight today, not only on the analytic scale clinically, but also philosophically why Freud as a thinker is important. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I have to say. 
Hey everybody, I'm Nick Castellucci. I'm one half of the Vanishing Mediators. Um, and I am super excited about this course on a text which I consider to be one of the most important out there for understanding basic psychoanalytic concepts, uh, drive theory. And as Andrew was saying, Freud's contribution to philosophy, a sort of a almost inadvertent contribution to philosophy. You know, Freud never set out to advance conceptually uh, the state of philosophy at the time, but he almost, let's say, by mistake, made this discovery, um, which is that drive and, and sexuality are very much intertwined, if not one and the same thing. And I think what's really fascinating about that and what Alenka emphasizes again and again is that this is not an insight which philosophy can afford to simply dispense with, nor is it just a sort of something subsumable under the umbrella of philosophy, but makes so many uh, classic concepts of philosophy impossible in a sense. And I think that's um, just the way, the way she's able to articulate that is unrivaled. And uh, she's her work is such a great supplement to Zizek's work because, you know, Zizek can be very frenzied and um, disorienting in a great way. But I find Alenka just so much more at points easy to follow. And, uh, yeah, I'm just really excited about this course. Hi, everybody. Uh... My name is Michael Down, He's the author of the Dangerous Maybe blog. Sorry, there's some background music going on here. So, Dave, if you can, can you hear me? We can hear you, okay. but we we can't hear the music though. So it's okay. Good. good. Okay. So, I really can't say enough good things about Alenka Dubonchic as a thinker. I think yeah. what is sex is going to be one of these all time classic texts, especially in psychoanalytic thought. But as a Zizekian, right, like Nick was saying, there's something very frenzy or rushed or busy about how Slavoj presents his philosophical ideas. Not to say that I, I think he's a systematic thinker. I think he's incredibly rigorous, but he has a very fast-paced style. What is interesting about reading Olenka is that she's very slow, very methodical, and very strategic in how she goes about presenting her ideas. She almost has like a Heideggerian tempo to her, the, the precision of her thought. And even though, and, and, and that's what's so great about it is her and Slava are incredibly close theoretically when it comes to what they think about sex and from, from a Lacanian perspective. But you can get so much difference at the same time from reading the two of them just because of how their styles vary. And I mean, when you, any, any chance you get to read or listen to a link of talk is a gift. If you're interested in Lacanian theory and yeah, I just, I mean, getting to meet her at the end of the course is a true honor. Um, very few thinkers have influenced me as much as she has. And let's be honest, Slavoj casts a very big shadow. Um, but Alenka is every bit the thinker that Slavoj is. She's just very methodical. She doesn't, she's not going to write a book a year. And so, you know, of course, Slavoj is going to have a big part of the, the spotlight because of how productive he is. And I just, that shouldn't take away from how incredibly insightful Alenka is. And I think it's fantastic you guys are doing this course, um, especially with in the context of the culture war, because we're so stuck in this binarism between biological essentialism and social constructivism that what Lacanian psychoanalysis does, especially as formulated by Alenka here and Slavoj, um, 
it gives us a third option. I mean, I, I know you, both of you have emphasized this, but I, I just would, I want to have the opportunity just to say you're absolutely right. And this third option, I think, is a path forward for thinking our way out of this deadlock of culture war views on sexuality. And so I think that's also, there's something of great political potential at work in thinking this through as well. But just the last thing is just, and Nick also was getting at this, this connection that Alenka is really, really bringing out more than even Lacan um, about the Freudian revolution, about Freud's discovery, is that sex is ontological. And, and it's easy to just go, okay, well, whatever. Yeah, okay, cool little connection. But the point is, if that's the case, if what we call sexuality is not just something, you know, that we have in common with all species or animals, right? Reproductive systems. If we, if we step outside of that and we take this psychoanalytic concept of sexuality, which based on drive, especially, um, and the distinction between pleasure and jouissance, what that gets us is an entirely different way of doing philosophy if philosophy if first philosophy especially is ontology and if sex is our ontological makeup then we're not doing philosophy if we don't take sex into account and so that's where we really get this marriage between philosophy and psychoanalysis to bear fruit is to to see yes like sex is ontological and and therefore philosophical okay We've gotten into that a little bit, Cadell and I, in our pre-course lectures. We did, at this point, three. We had a conversation called Three Reasons to Read What is Sex. Then we had a conversation, or as a lecture, on the introduction to what is sex. And then we had uh, one just last week about the conclusion to what is sex. And... Uh, and now, now maybe we're getting a little excessive here with this, but I, I, <laughs> I just don't care. I want to get everyone talking about this. And this, people are going to be like, well, why this book? Why isn't it some other book? Look, there's a lot of books. So there's a lot of fantastic books. But sometimes you just got to make a decision and you got to actually read one. And this is one of those ones that for me was in the periphery, always kind of like, oh, people, oh, it's such a great book. The Ethics of the Real and What is Sex? These are such great books. But... I learned a long time ago that if there's a book like that that keeps kind of coming close but you don't quite ever dive into it and then you have a friend or a fellow traveler who's stoked on it and is looking to reread it that's the proof that's when you know if you have a friend who's read it before and wants to reread it and they actually want to do it with you it's on a different level than some other book where they're just like yeah it's great check it out you know what I mean? So I think all of you guys have, I've heard all of you talk about it in different contexts. And so that's why it was like, yeah, this is the one, you know, cause I originally I thought maybe it would be the ethics of the real. No, it makes sense to start it here. And I think one of the biggest reasons it makes sense is because we all like to talk about drive, death drive. And so I guess my first big um, question for you all are like, what are the, the benefits, but also potential drawbacks of using these terms interchangeably. Of specifically death drive? Death drive, drive, sex. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, I think that it'll be interesting working through the course in terms of gaining some conceptual clarity on the relationship between sex, death, drive. Uh, epistemology ontology even even just now sort of it it's it's come up um you know it, it, and and i guess some people might might perceive um i guess the the difference between using concepts technically versus using concepts in colloquial everyday language and and sort of saying like you know do, do we need to have specific clarification on on the way we're we're using those terms I think that that will certainly be 
something that you'll you'll benefit in the course from is is getting that the clarity on those on those concepts and 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 being able to think through some of them i mean the 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 first the first thing for me as it comes to using the concept of drive whether it's related to you know equating sexuality as equal to drive or equating drive as related to 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 death to death drive is this level of um the the onto epistemology like to me like what 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 she's really doing is like that the central thesis to me is that sex is the short circuit between ontology and epistemology and that short circuit is what gets us out of the culture war because and i think michael was right mikey was right to bring up that it's important that we're teaching this in the context of the culture war and i'm going to try and do my best i think we're going to both do our best to to you know bring the book to that moment and engage political questions because i think the book is calling for that but precisely this idea of the short circuit is that, as Mikey already said, this binary between ascent, between essentialism, biological essentialism on the one hand, which would be, let's say, the ontological dimension, or social constructivism on the other hand, that would be the epistemological dimension, is that the short circuit ruptures both of these clean narratives. Right. And that's something that Alenka will emphasize again and again, is that whenever our political discourse formulates a very clear narrative, which points towards a very clear understanding of what sex is, like sex is biological, sex is reducible to chromosomal interaction, sex is genetic. That's a very clear narrative pointing towards a, a, a relation to sexuality. Or if we say sex is socially constructed, sex is something which is produced from our cultural matrix. Sex is something of a power game of discursive regimes. That's, again, another clear narrative pointing to that we know what sex is positively. And it what comes up again and again in what is sex is the short circuit is the object disoriented ontology that we actually like sex is a disruptive element. Sex is something we know negatively. Sex is something we know through the non-relation, right? So this is this is something that comes up uh, again and again. And I think precisely, you know, you know. Let me just say before before passing it on is, I think that these clear narratives of what sex is and the way they're used in the culture war is yes, they make for pop YouTube content. Like people make entire YouTube channels exploiting the sexual difference and exploiting sexuality in the in the political wars but really what's at stake is i think something radically radical political is when we think through sex we're going to realize that we aren't going to be able to think beyond let's say neoliberal digital culture and techno capitalism without taking sex seriously philosophically and philosophers who pretend they don't philosophers who think they can do philosophy without sex or psychoanalysts who think they can cut themselves off from politics. Neither of these gestures help us in terms of a, let's say a genuine emancipatory drive and what, what, whatever I'll say a genuine emancipatory death drive or something. Like that. Yeah, that was a that's a good question, Dave. And I really like what you were saying, Cadell, <clears throat> in really showing how like using these terms colloquially or just like on a commonsensical way kind of obfuscates the uh, not only philosophical and social applications that these have, but also where it derives from clinically. And you know, the point of psychoanalysis is something that's quite even different from therapism or just therapy culture, um, you know, from CBT or trying to diagnose you. And so like, when we look at drives, it's something that we don't experience on a sort of on like phenomenological level, but yet, you know, it does undermine us, you know, jouissance or enjoyment, sexuality, there is a traumatic kernel to it. And, you know, it is disoriented, as Cadell says, because like when you look at it in a clinical sense, like and Zupanjic points out, like, you know, why should we worry about sex? Like, you know, aren't we in a more 
liberal, progressive culture compared to Freud's time in which everybody's more open. They're more obliged to be your true self, be authentic, uh, no need to repress yourself. And we're talking about on the level of social suppression or oppression. Repression is totally on the level of the unconscious where repression is like, as Lacan says in seminar one, to kind of be Heideggerian, it's like a forgetfulness of being, but it's also like a for- forgetfulness of forgetting, right? Because it's so, um, it's a part of our entrance into the world that it's constitutive. Tra- trauma and sexuality, as so long as it's a contradiction, is constitutive. But the main thing I want to touch at is like what makes this so interesting is that you would think that sex is like on a more progressive level, whether we're talking about the way people could just identify with some gender or just be, you know, choose to be very traditional, conservative or whatever. The point is, is that both of them fail to get at sex in this, uh, you know, binary opposition of biological essentialism, uh, heteronormative and uh, gender construction and a sort of butler bro type deal. But like the main thing is that both of them don't aim at, uh, and this is kind of meta, at a truth about what sex and gender is. Rather, they both rely on each other as the other to maintain a sort of master-slave dialectic of enjoyment. They don't care about getting their point across, but that they maintain a discourse of opposition and that they're getting enjoyment from hating the other, right? But in a clinical sense, it's funny because the even the sort of liberal, progressive, like, you know, I'm polyamorous or whatever, as soon as sexuality is talked about in the transference and made itself known as an object, for a lack of a better term, it becomes disorienting because what is involved in sex for psychoanalysis is also uh, related to the drive but that it is formulated through fantasy and imagine expressing one's fantasy, not their sexual practice, but the fantasy that orbits around its lack becomes traumatic because you have nobody to really uh, give you validation or criticism of it because, you know, you could be at work, you could be in a social setting or, you know, at school and talk about sex and people are like, haha, that's so funny. You're like, man, that's weird. And even though there's judgment, it's like you get that sort of recognition and feedback that allows for resistance. But when there's nobody but the analyst that just is like this and hystericizes you to go on what what that sort of sexual fantasy means, you get into this deadlock, this void, and that becomes traumatic. But what is so interesting is that also shows the level of the social symptom that, you know, is at the heart of this problem. And Zupanchik and Zizek point this out really well. And even other people that take psychoanalysis seriously, someone like Karatani, Balabar, Althusser, Freud realized it as well that, you know, we're not dealing with individual problems, but the level of a symptom that spreads around the social. And this is the deadlock. This is important. And uh, hopefully I'm not going off on a tangent. Like the point is that like, to kind of piggyback off of what, um, Fidel was saying about like this disorientment. It's like when you realize that, you know, sexuality is disorienting on the level of, you know, the discourse of sexuality and biological sensualism or gender identity, social constructivism, that when you have that third option of, uh, epistemological or onto epistemological of sex both from a philosophical psychoanalytic perspective and a clinical perspective we show that both sides get distraught both in the discourse and in the clinic when they free associate because they can't get at the root of that because to get to the root you get a traumatic lack you get at the real you get at what is lying is that the, that identity is split that it retroactively goes back to this primordial um, traumatic kernel that allows them to be, but also to repress what can't be really, you know, spoken about, I guess. But this is revolutionary because it's like 
the point is, is like now, you know, identity is split. It's lacking, but it, it, it involves an emancipatory project that doesn't allow recognition of the other or politics of resentment or representation. The need to have sexual binary of, oh, um, you know, feminism or anything else like this that relies on hating the other that is supposed to be oppressing you or feeling the need to play victim or to police others or be a representative of the marginality. So your answer is basically that drive is implicated in both sides of the culture war in like a really fundamental way. Yeah, in a misrecognized form that is kind of like vanishing because of this, I would like to say it's a master slave dialectic. Like they both enjoy like that fight and the enjoyment, there's a sexual enjoyment to it because they both are getting off of their own discourse, but at the same time, they rely on the other to kind of hate and uh, also reel them in into this enjoyment of, oh, you're a transphobe or, oh, no, you're a woke, you know, leftist or something like that, you know. I mean, like j j just, just, to, just to build on what, what Big Sig's saying there, like, you just have to pay attention, for example, to the discourse, especially of of Jordan Peterson since he joined the Daily Daily Wire. And like basically the whole of the Daily Wire is a good example of the way in which the sexual difference is exploited ideologically. Um, and they enjoy a certain discourse about the traditional normativity. And they enjoy a certain discourse about the biological essentialism. And they enjoy creating the enemy of the the woke constructivist and they even build a million dollar empire based off of the exploitation of that and 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 this is this is this is that's 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 to me a very um tangible example but then you could also have entire ideological discourses within the university system which are kind of doing the same thing in an opposite in an opposite way so I mean, it's a very, uh, I mean, drive is, and death drive, I think, in both situations is deeply implicated in these ideologies. And they both pretend to give the public a clear orientation, which is non-problematic. Instead of an, they, they try to give the public an object-oriented ontology as opposed to an object-disoriented ontology. <laughs> and and, that, and, and that, that, that creates huge problems. Like, I know, Dave, you've, you know, been... You know, uh, we've talked a little bit about, like, for example, the phenomenon of puberty blockers and things like that, where when young children are in confronting the most disorienting time in life, which is coming through a puberty transition, we try to create a clear orientation, which is a pure ideological obfuscation of the real of thinking through the pu puberty itself. <laughs> Which is mostly not a thing that one is even capable of thinking through, is merely something that you survive, that you have to kind of get through. And it's and people are like, oh yeah, well you can always just think about it later. You just push a pause button. And it's like, there's this whole discourse where it's like, you're being sold a fake bill of goods. There's no there's no pause buttons here. There's, uh, there's something people go through and there's some people who are going to make it so that you didn't experience it. You might experience something analogous later, but it's not... It's not on the, it's not, and, and the thing is, is it could be life-saving for like one in a fucking hundred million people, but then they, they're trying, it, it's being packaged on TikTok these days as though it's like, it's a solution for anybody who's gender questioning whatsoever. And so this is just, the bigger issue is not the, the blockers, and I've been very adamant about this, the bigger issue is the medicalization of something that is properly speaking the domain of theory not psychiatry in the first place, right? It's, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's in the domain of theory, um, and it and, and it's also belongs in the clinic or in therapy, right? But it's like, no, those things have been put to the side, and instead, uh, psychiatry, the cosmetic industry, the, phar the pharmaceutical industry, um, those have superseded. And obviously, a big part of the reason that those things have been uh, superseded theory and therapy is because there's... Um, the institutional what well, involves thinking yes and the you know, the institutions first of all don't really think but second of all they are 
they're uh, lawsuit averse, right? And so for the time being, they think that the lawsuits are on the side of that there will be more lawsuits if they don't do this. Um, well, only time will tell because that seems to be backfiring. But um, I want to I want to really quick here interpolate you, Mikey, and um, I say you. I see you in the coffee shop, and uh, you probably have to leave in like 20 minutes. So, yeah, do you, any, any thoughts so far on either that question or something else that you want to talk about? I mean, I can – so, okay. Like one of, one of the famous statements Lacan made is that every drive is a death drive. And it's like if, for him, like if we want to talk about our, the partial drives of our body – like there's not like some free floating or metaphysical principle called death drive and somehow it's separate from the partial drives of our body. No, for him, he's saying that the ways that we go about giving ourselves too much trouble of getting off of enjoying ourselves that undermine our, our homeostasis, undermine our security, our stability and disrupt our lives. Right. That, um, again, give us too much trouble. This is how Lacan talks about it in seminar 11. They are death drive. Like that, that's, that's death drive. And so the thing is sexuality for us has to do with not getting what we want, which this is where it, 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 there's different ways of talking about all this. So we can talk about human sexuality through fantasy. We can talk about it through drive. We can talk about it through desire we can talk about it through jouissance and all of these different concepts add a layer of meaning and insight to this whole thing. But ultimately what makes us have drive sexuality, so to speak, is that lack enters into us when we get integrated into language and that for us, once we are, cognitively capable of pursuing our desire, pursuing enjoyment. The big question is, what is what is the ultimate state that I have to be in to get the ultimate enjoyment? Now, of course, we might not have this thought at the conscious level, but our, our central nervous systems are organized around this in a way. And the trick that Lacan figured out and that a link is going to run with is that there is no sexual relation or that sexuality is a non-relation and the point here is that we're always seeking some sort of perfect complementarity if i meet the right person if i'm in the right situation i will have it right and yet in reality there is no blueprint for us to have full enjoyment to have, to have a perfect utopian type of enjoyment. And this lack of knowledge in the real, which is to say this knowledge is not just lacking in our societies or in science or in intelligible discourse, the universe itself lacks this knowledge. Like there, there, isn't, uh, there isn't a built-in complementarity at work that, that we, if we work at it, whether it's through, um, economic success, religious practices, um, self-discipline, whatever it is, we're never going to attain this knowledge because this knowledge isn't there to be attained. And this whole thing about that there is no ultimate blueprint or paradigm, or even we could talk like a Platonist, there is no platonic form, no essence of human sexuality. That's precisely, in a weird sense, the negative essence of human sexuality is that there is no absolute blueprint on how we are to go about getting enjoyment from the other or giving enjoyment to the other and what fantasy does is fantasy covers over this lack this this missing signifier because if the, the missing signifier in a certain way is this non-relation right that what is missing at the heart of our conceptual fields, our conceptual matrices, our bodies of knowledge is how is one to go about having enjoyment with the other, 
no. right? How does one form a sexual relation? Now, you can read the Kama Sutra and you can read all kinds of self-help books or, or, you know, books written to give you relationship advice. And they're all going to give you some sort of account of how to have a good, healthy relationship. But ultimately, the, the, the hard Lacanian lesson here is that we're all on our own when it comes to this. And the enjoyment we actually get that we call sexual enjoyment depends on the very lack of a sexual relationship. We are all giving ourselves too much trouble. We are all getting worked up. We are all having drama in our lives precisely because there is no default complementarity that guarantees sexual enjoyment. And so that's how, in a way, like we enjoy the non-relation. It's the ultimate obstacle that gives us excitation, frustration, gets us worked up. All of the drama and the struggles in our lives are ultimately the result of us not having a default essential sexuality. And that, so what is sex? It's, it's the lack of, or what I should, what is human sexuality? It is the enjoyment we get from not having a default complementarity in our enjoyment. That's how I define it on the spot. There's probably, or there's not probably, there's definitely better ways to articulate it, but that's, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I'd like to build off of um, what everyone's been saying up until this point. I think it's like all of these issues come down to, you know, what it what's colloqu colloquially referred to as identity politics. But I've, obviously identity politics exists on both sides. So Cadell, he's, he was talking about Jordan Peterson and the Daily Wire and this exploitation of sexual difference. Well, it's like what spans both sides is nowadays this social injunction to affirm an identity so the problem that mikey's talking about of uh, the impossibility of sexual complementarity has always been a thing but i think a relatively new phenomenon is just the plethora of i would ca call them consumer choices that one is uh, met with when it comes to adopting identity markers on either side, right? So it's like even on the totally 100% unquestionably cis heteronormative side, now there are plenty of identity markers that can be can be played with on that side too. And it creates a new layer of confusion and distortion when it comes to dealing with this lack and trying to get enjoyment right, trying to game enjoyment, trying to strategize it in a way that would like not just secure the enjoyment, but also secure an identity for that person. And it's like, well, the drive gets its satisfaction because there is this vanishing horizon always of identity. And it's always also as, as, um, Andrew was saying going to be dependent on the the other and an impossible other that maybe appropriate term here is impenetrable right it's like but we live in a time when otherness whether it's the the fascist approach of just like get rid of the you know the the Jew is quilting point or the approach of like well on the other end, like, let's say a more liberal approach of like, well, we need to understand everything that everyone goes through. Or if we can't understand, we have to like kind of, you know, sanction off what is this person's subjective lived experience. And therefore we can't talk about this because we have this subjective lived experience. But either way, it's like there is a kind of this kernel of otherness, which we're, we're trying to vanquish in a way. And it eludes us because sex is, by definition, an ontological impossibility. Yeah. I'd like to add something on that, if you don't mind, just real quick, because I liked how you pinpointed what I was saying with the consumer choices. If you look on whether it's 
an algorithm on Amazon or like if you look at like, um, you know, the social media bios, it's like, you know, your pronouns are like your orientation. You got like a list of boxes, but like if nothing meets your requirement, you got that other box that, that says other and you just fill in the blank, which then allows that social uh, injunction to enjoy on the super ego to then demarcate. OK, let's exceed limits. Let's continue to go and enjoy and enjoy. And it makes me think of like when I used to go into Barnes and Noble. So like usually the, the random layout of Barnes and Nobles is like, or the, the typical Barnes and Nobles is like, if you have psychology, then you got self-help. And there's this one book that just was just so funny. It's like uh, sex and relationships. And it's like the ethical slut. It's like you could have the sort of transgression ah. <laughs> without the guilt. And it's just like, you know, the whole thing about like, let's be authentic, uh, uh, the problem is just like we just like you need to accept who you are, be authentic and just like overcome these biases. It's like, you know, well, then if if, if that's the thing that just kind of justifies the fact that there is no uh, that there is no sexual relation, that there's a non relation, because it's like ultimately you're just left with this masturbatory way of living, because if you're just trying to get rid of this other because it's always a bias, then it's like, well, the disavow is the fact that it's like really you're getting off to yourself because there's a fundamental lack, you know? Yeah, that book was one of the ones I read um, during a certain phase of my life, and it's it's bad, man. It's a, it's uh, really you could use you know, sex before dawn or sex at dawn, whatever it was called, uh, opening up and the ethical slut as like the three main, you know, if you wanted to do if you wanted to write a whole book about the ideology of like naive progressivism to its extreme, those three books could just be, that's all you need. Just, just read them back and forward. And there you go. That's it. Just run with them. But, um, there's what was a the lot third of third one, Dave. Oh, you, you uh, said sex at dawn, ethical slut. And what was the third one? Opening up. Okay. Yeah. They're all about polyamory basically. Um, and so, and which is which is interesting, right? Because they basically all of them have their own fundamental assumptions about sex that are very that 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 decomplicate things. It's not complicated as long as you know the rules. And then they make up a bunch of bullshit normative rules that nobody would agree with or agree on. Um, if you were to get like fifty people in a room, there's no way that you're going to have a lot of people agreeing on these things. And then if you could get people to agree on a lot of these things. There's going to be the contradiction between uh, conscious belief, right, and uh, and the actual things that people are feeling, and the tensions that people are living out in their actual relationships, and that's that you know the, the, you try to make all of this explicit, try to bring it all to the level of oh well now everything's sanitized and ethical, um, and it doesn't get any less complicated actually. In fact, it just requires increasing amounts of time and energy. And it, even with the increasing amounts of time and energy, it's just gets more complicated. But um, it is a, it is like this sort of way of uh, of sanitizing it, right? It's a sort of way of, of gentrifying it, right? It's it's just, it's a way of taking something that's inherently problematic um, and trying to and, and 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 allowing you to have a sort of disavowed relationship to it, right? But. The really good question, there's several really good questions that have come up in the chat. And the one that I wanted to focus on for a moment is the one that Solitariat asked. And I think it's kind of the commonsensical question here, um, which is what's wrong with the biological essentialism? Like what's wrong with it? What, what really is the matter with it? Um, and so I would like different people to, you know, here to take their there are cracks at that. Like he said that he thinks that, it, you know, a, bio, a, a good biological essentialism leaves room for drive, jouissance and the rest. Like what's, what's the issue? Why can't we basically understand humans from their biology and then kind of add on some of this psychoanalytic stuff when it suits us? Well, I let anyone else answer that as well, but I mean, my very short answer would be because of the symbolic order, because of the signifier. <laughs> and and actually, if you just fall into biological essentialism, what you're doing is, is you're falling into um, 
let's say, the traditional conservative game or the traditional religious game, which tries to obfuscate the difference between sex and gender, there is a meaningful gap between sex and gender that's opened up because of the signifier and because of the symbolic order. And there is a need, like there are literally important, like like not not everyone's biological sex and gender identity match or are symmetrical in, in, in a cis way. Like that language actually is important. It's just, it's what we're trying to avoid here is falling into one, and this is a philosophical, this is why thinking is necessary. We're trying not to fall into one of the unthought ideological extremes where if you take the extreme of that mismatch you get well it's just totally disconnected and we can just use puberty blockers and we can and we can totally play with our gender identity because we can just construct it out of that's taking it too far but there is a gap and that gap is important and 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 there does need to we do need to make room for you know uh, expressions of identity which do not map neatly or nicely in the conventional way there's nothing wrong with that you know so if you just reduce it to biological essentialism you're you're missing a you're missing the entire dimension in which the a human comes to be in relationship to the signifier in a way that might not have a relationship to the to the to the to the genetic composition of their body That's legitimate. Then to piggyback off of what Cadell just said, look, if if you're going to do biological essentialism, what you're going to do is keep us locked inside of a domain ruled by biological imperatives, which is going to have to do with instincts, need, uh, biological imperatives, right? Jouissance is what goes against all that, right? That's in a way how we become denatured. In the, in the psychoanalytic sense, is that what we actually enjoy and what our central nervous systems are oriented around is not the basic satisfaction of needs and biological homeostasis, but excess self-destruction, derailment of, of ourselves, right? And like Cadell said, what the signifier, right? And like we always use this term signifier, but what, what the mediation of language does is it opens up this dimension of where a thing is not identical to itself precisely because we can think it's absence now that sounds abstract but this is this key thing that we're always going to come back to with what the symbolic order does and the point is when you introduce absence when you you know again i'll use an, michael jordan Right. Most of us were not just thinking about Michael Jordan, but that signifier makes something absent become present, even though Jordan isn't sitting in the room with us. He's not present in that way. Language fundamentally introduces this play of absence and presence in an incredibly detailed and robust way. And it opens up for us because we are subjects of language. We are baptized into it, so to speak. It gives us this ability to start comparing and contrasting i enjoyed this but what if i had it like that and what if i had like it, it's this is a simplified version of it but once you open up this domain of being of enjoyment being phantasmatic which of course a fantasy is something that's absent but it's present right it's absent because you don't actually have that that phantasmatic state realized but the enjoyment is in it being absent right and so what happens like this this is where we go away from biological essentialism where biological essentialism is not mediated through the symbolic order it's not mediated through this this ability to fantasize and that the fact that human sexuality is oriented around fantasy absence um the signifier all of these various things this is what gets us outside of biological essentialism and so that's that's just another thing which which is to say we wouldn't even have drive if we were bi reducible to our biology so just to answer soul's question because so i kind of did a long version of it to answer the question is by a lot let's let's do like 
biological drive for us is an oxymoron. Like the whole point is drive is not biological. It's a derailment. We could even call it a corruption, a perversion of aspects of our biology. But the, the, the point though, of course, is that it's not like we have some absolutely pure biological integrity prior to language. The point is if we do the thought experiment, Dave, that we're always doing like the feral child, the feral child, or if you do any type of thought experiment where you take a human baby and somehow you're able to keep it biologically alive without it having access to the big other social norms, um, anything like that, you don't get a human in the robust sense. You don't get a, a being that has human sexuality in the way that we do. And so what you see is that in order for us to even become the type of beings that we are, we have to go through this detour into the symbolic, through the signifier, right. which there outgoes biological essentialism with that. Yeah, I really like how you ended it with talking about um, both the kind of perverse aspect of sexuality and fantasy. Uh, I want to just invoke Freud and talk about the three essays of sexuality. In the first essay, he is imminently critiquing the um, biological essentialism of his time with other theories as well. Um, with starting with the what was called inverts, right? Pretty much having to deal with homosexuals. Because if we are, if we reduce everything down to biological essentialism, which is also uh, presupposing complementary uh, complementarity theory, which is that you know sexuality or love is complementary, he even invokes the whole um, Aristophanes myth from Plato in the Symposium of like oh uh, Zeus split man in half, so now our destiny is to search for our other half so that we could be complete, right? That's the whole thing about what love is supposed to be, which is part of this fantasy, right? That sexuality is in, in our aim to get that object of satisfaction, we will feel whole. And Freud talks about how, you know, inverts or homosexuals are, there's nothing in them biologically that makes them wrong or, you know, deviant compared to the traditional a heterosexual that follows its quote unquote biological imperative essential aspect. In fact, even if we talk about this supposed male or female uh, uh, essential features, which are seeking the opposite sex for reproduction, what we realize is that even then the normal sexual behavior is deviated itself because they find satisfaction still not from the partner that they have, but from fetishes, from other deviant objects that aim at satisfaction, even if they are in a complementary relationship. And so Freud is critiquing, again, both the essentialism of his time, and even, I think there are some aspects of social constructivism that he's probably critiquing as well. He even talks about how, like, well, some people will say that, oh, well, the homosexual is really uh, trying to desire another man uh, because they have a female brain. And they desire another man that has somehow wired to have a female brain. It's like, nah, nah, son, that's not what it's like at all. Pretty much, you can't find that anywhere. There's no way to prove that um, scientifically. And these theories are based upon flawed presuppositions. But ultimately, that all sexuality, as Michael, Michael was saying, is perverse. And it not only aims at deviant objects, but also derails from that because the point of sexuality is it's not about biological essentialism or constructivism that it can't reach its destination because it's caught in this excessive deadlock of uh destroying itself when it tries to get to its object of enjoyment this is you know when we look at um for instance uh psychopathology of everyday life freud is trying to remember why he forgets signorelli's name and it reminds him of a patient who he is talking to that was like you know life without sex would you know be ultimately a meaningless life and well the problem is it's like well what's the deadlock of enjoyment but the, the fact is that it's like even though i think he was very much like not a nymphomaniac but just had a lot of sex but just like thinking a life without sex is meaningless well if you're having a lot of the sex then why is life meaningless why are you feeling so obsessional and erotic so that puts into question what is sexuality and so you have to go beyond 
just thinking of it in a typical chromosomal essentialist thing when you see phenomenon like this and what psychoanalysis and Freud was able to theorize with his three essays and even show that sexuality also becomes a problem when we look at narcissism and how the ego becomes its sexual object but undermines itself. Hey guys, I, I have to go. I like what you said. Um, I just want to say one of the, and this is almost like a snarky kind of debate bro kind of retort, but I'll just say if biological essentialism was actually true, we wouldn't even have to defend it. I was going to say that as well. Part, part, part of the, yeah. <laughs> part of the reputation of it is that we even have to defend it. Now think about something like if imagine me trying to argue to you, Hey, we really have to breathe in order to live. Like, the respiratory system breathing, it is like a biological thing, right? Okay, if our sexuality functioned like that, we wouldn't even be having a discussion about it. So, okay, got to go, guys. Talk to you later. Fantastic point, See Mikey. You, Mikey. Right. Later. Well, I, wanna... I also wanted to say something something quick on the biological essentialism as well that I always say is, is, is the fundamental difference between uh, Darwinian notions of sexuality and Freudian notions of sexuality is that Darwinian notions of sexuality are organized around biological reproduction, whereas Freudian notions of sexuality is really about enjoyment. And so the like the the the, the real split and, and the enjoyment is related to drive sexuality, which is there paradoxically even before instinct in the human. So it undermines the biological instinct from the get-go. Like that's the whole that's why people reacted the way they did about the discovery of infantile sexuality. Like infantile sexuality was a big, like a big uh, to do or a big, uh, you know, violation of sensibilities precisely because it undermined biological essentialism in this way. I'd like to add something to that. I mean, actually, I don't have too much to add because everybody else pretty much nailed it. But I think what's interesting about um, this phrase itself, biological essentialism, would be to... Uh, give my spin on a famous Lacanian aphorism. It's like what's in biology more than biology. So what is the essence beyond these, you know, what we think of as, as laws. And I think this is just another way of saying exactly what Mikey said is why would biology need justification in language? Why doesn't it just play out? all in its own and it is language itself which introduces this dimension that is uh, you know the, the the bone in the throat of any clear self-contained self-satisfied like conception of sex or you know identity itself and it's you know this here is the problem this is also a um, good way to understand the real i think you know, the real capital R of sex is what doesn't allow, you know, nature to be fully whole, what makes the other barred. And that's one of the realizations that um, one has reading, uh, you know, Lacan, it's not just about the subject being barred, but Andrew can um, tell me if this is more alienation or separation in the you know process of the development of the individual. But basically, to understand that the bar that separates you from your unconscious is one and the same with the bar in the other. And in, in many ways, what's more traumatic is not that, oh, the, the, just the advent of the signifier, the emergence of the signifier is something that has like a positive existence that just derails everything but also just understanding that oh nature itself is 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 a not all nature itself is incomplete it doesn't know what it is it doesn't know exactly what it's doing and it you know the idea of post enlightenment thinking the scientific revolution is to to fetishize nature in that way that it knows what it's doing there's an embedded teleological knowledge that is not just dependent on the whims of some all-powerful deity who might wake up angry one day and smite everybody it's like that's supposedly a, a you know more more progressive more advanced way of uh, approaching the world but it's it's based on something that 
you know, is it's just as um, silly in a way, it's just as arbitrary. So I, I think that you've all done a good job responding to a hypothetical gender, sorry, uh, biological essentialists. Um, the one in the chat, I think he's feeling like these are all swings and a miss. But I, I want to see if I can't. He, he said, so for instance, he said nothing about recognizing that the two reproductive strategies, male and female, can't be transformed in one lifetime negates anything you guys are saying. Right? Well, so what, why would he say something like that except that the definition of biological essentialism he's working with has very has a very specific end in mind. And so, Swole, I, I encourage you to, at the point that you've caught up with this in the video, go ahead and, you know, clarify your terms because, like, you know, we, I think we've all just done our due diligence in sort of addressing a sort of standard um, biolog biological essentialist. And we, I think we all did it in a way that, that means we could get into a university conference still and we wouldn't get canceled. But I'm going to mess that up for at least everyone, well, for myself. And but just by saying, I've got no problem with their, with biology being a, an essential component or condition of what makes any given human subject who they are. And I mean, to say that it's a sufficient condition is obviously another thing altogether. I don't think any of us obviously would say that it's a sufficient condition. I don't think the swole would either. But the, I, I want to I kind of just actually just get myself in trouble here. I'm just, I am saying that being born with a womb, especially, I said especially being born with a womb, makes you who you are in a fundamental way in an absolutely fundamental way. Okay, and if you have a womb, then that means that you that getting raped means something more than what it means to a, a person who can also be raped, who's a guy, right? Because you can also then have to deal with a pregnancy. Now you might not have to. Now you know not all wombs are operable. They're not all fertile, but that existential possibility on your horizon is so different than when you don't have that on your horizon. That fundamentally impacts everything about you going through your life. Um, there is no, there's no wishing that away. Um, and, I, it, and, 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 oh, well, I want to make sure that I've said my piece. And so if sure. you, if you get, if you get your womb removed so that that's no longer a problem and then you get enough, uh, you, you go through hormone uh, therapy and surgeries so that you, no, no one even uh, will think, oh, that's a woman. Then you've officially, uh, both in the terms of being in danger all of the time as a woman, but also in terms of that being on your, 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 your possible horizon you've pretty much removed those things from, from, your, from your daily affairs and now you have a new set of uh, problems to deal with. The, the reason I'm, I'm drawing this out though is because uh, to, to get into a position, to transition into a position where that's no longer something that overdetermines your, your every waking moment, um, to even be in a different situation is still in reference to that though. And so gender, I, I mean, I do like the way that Butler talks about it. She talks about gender being a, a coping strategy. It's a survival strategy, right? But sex is something that we have to fucking deal with. It's something in a sort of sense that we are cursed with. It's something that we are thrown into in like a Heideggerian sense. We're in it. And uh, and so it is it's something very it is something very essential about us. It just it doesn't in any way, shape, or form totalize us. It doesn't it doesn't overdetermine 
us. It doesn't tell us everything that you need to know about a person, right? So I, I, I don't even think most, I, I don't know a single trans person who would disagree with me, actually, just off the top of my head of just people I have relationships with. But I'm, I'm sure that out there, there could be people who are like, oh, well, I don't like the way that you said something because maybe I could turn that into something else, whatever. But my basic point is just that the, the organs that you are born into and with, it's not just social constructs. Like you, are, you have actual different existential possibilities on your horizon and that those determine how you're going to cope. Or like the, the, the parameters of possibilities at your disposal for coping with those. So that's basically what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think you clarified some things there that I don't need to respond too deeply to that. But I mean, like, let's clear something up. Like, biological essentialism and social constructivism both have a truth. Neither are totalizing truths. Neither are totalizing truths. So let me just give like, I, 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 I don't know if you guys saw, but I gave the technical definition of biological essentialism in the, in the chat between us. Let me, let me just read it there. Here's the technical definition. Biological essentialism is the belief that there are only two genders and that those genders are directly connected to human biology. That has a partial truth, but it's not a totalizing truth. And the reason why it's not a totalizing truth is, like I say, because of the symbolic order and the relationship to the signifier, that there's a gap between the two. And yes, if you have a womb, that's in some sense determinative, but it's not a totalizing, uh, it's not a totalizing uh, biological reduction. And again, it, it's already always already undermined by drive sexuality anyway. And specifically, like what Nick was saying, that even if we're born with a womb or born with a penis, there's something about the ontological incompletion of reality itself, which leaves things radically open where nature does not have like that, where there is a certain lacking knowledge in the real, not just socially constructed as well. And the, and, and here's now, here's the big, now here's the explosive bomb for biological essentialism in the 21st century. As far as I'm concerned is genetic engineering. Just the fact that genetic engineering is a possibility, just the fact that that synthetic biology is a possibility. That means that's that's literally proof of ontological incompletion of reality. Because if we can genetically engineer and if we can engage in synthetic biology projects and that's an imminent sort of phenomenon within human history. That wouldn't be that that couldn't exist if there was an ontological completion. It requires that there's ontological incompletion. And we don't know what the fate of that is. We like there's a big here's like with, when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to this question, what is sex with the question mark? Ultimately, we're coming to confront the, the question mark and the question mark on both the side of our knowledge and the side of being. And that's how Alenka ends what is sex. There's the question mark of our knowledge and the question mark of being itself. And that's the short circuit. That was really, I'm glad you pulled out the definition there because even Swole was like, yeah, that is not the definition that I was working with. And so it's like at that point, if you're not working with that definition, since that's the one that's the go-to online, you just basically have to try to you yeah you you will want to use a more specific term for whatever it is you're trying to say and i think swole was get was liking what i was saying so basically what what is that well we're saying sex is real yes and it's a complicated piece of shit oh, and biology is real yeah and that those like it's, two it's things real are that you're born with a womb right and those two things are not the same but they're related right which is to say biology and, and, and sex in Zupanchich's sense. And I guess I, I want I to – well, I've got a couple of big questions for Cadell kind of on this line of thought. But I, I want to I see here if Andrew's got some, something he wanted to say because I think he does. Oh, yeah. No, I just wanted to uh, really just kind of – I guess it's just more piggybacking, but I'll just keep it brief. Um, but just to add on to that, it's like – Pretty much like 
when you look at biological essentialism, it mystifies and 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 everything else with the way that it exacerbates its discourse. And what I mean is that it forgets other discourses like anthropology and it kind of overly essentializes things by keeping things in like this kind of eternal vacuum without realizing like, oh, when you look at like the inquiries of like Levi Strauss, um, uh, Pierre Clestre and all these other like French uh, structuralist, post-structuralist anthropologists were talking about symbolic orders, especially Levi Strauss, the founder or the, the thinker that founded the term symbolic order, um, you know, as far as sex, it, it wasn't determined by essentialism, but rather like on a symbolic uh, position within an alliance, a clan and kinsmanship. And pretty much it was to maintain a certain peace and order and women. And so far as, you know, yeah, they were maternal figures, but really the notion of women in a symbolic status became somewhat uh, of importance as far as like uh, exchange, almost like a gift because it helped maintain uh, a society rather than collapsing a society. Um, and with Pierre Clastre, sex, sexuality or gender or whatever, wasn't again, based on uh, biological essentialism, rather maintaining an order to even prevent something like tyranny or the state from coming about uh, anything like a man was like, okay, you have like this arrow that makes you a man. And then like the basket. And if like anybody touched the basket, it's like this magical mana, like, Oh, society is going to collapse. But yet you had sexual difference because you had, you know, homosexuals, you had transsexuals, uh, you know, uh, gender fluidity in that, but yet it's like that maintaining of that. But really what I wanted to say, like to tie this in, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it's like, you still see this today because even the the essentialist bro would, would say that we're like, you know, confined to our body. But have men always been confined to their body? No, it's like, as Nick was saying, what's in biology more than biology? Because in so far as males are sexuated in the psychoanalytic sense, we're prone to castration, symbolic castration. We have to be the man that has to get the job, has to uh, be the perfect father figure, has to uh, pretty much be the go-getter, the breadwinner. Now, that's not always 100% the case, but it's it's majority, you know, a truism. And that women, and, and especially when we talk about, like, Beauvoir's book, like, women have, her arguments, like, women have always been reduced down to the body. But what's interesting, when you look at between the biological essentialist and the social constructivist, when it comes to the term woman, well, if you aren't a mother, um, you know, you don't want to be confined to the level of purely a daughter, you'd be dependent on your father. Uh, you're not a lesbian, you're not married. And let's say you go throughout your whole life like that, uh, which there are many women that do. And, you know, as you get into your middle ages, you go to menopause. So what are you then? Right? You become what Kristeva would be called the abject. And so right there, we get into the problem of like, you know, what is sex and what is you know, sexuality and gender, especially on the level of, of woman, right? I don't know if that makes sense, but it's something also that with this whole thing about like uh, Butlerian, it's like it kind of obfuscates that whole signifier of woman because of this, oh, you could be whatever identity you want, right? Well, it's like you're free, but really it's only free that so far as that you're in capitalist consumerism to make an identity that determines your consumer choices. And with that, that example of that woman that doesn't fit in either, what are they then? I, I mean, the where I've been going with that more recently is just to say that um, it is the job of every culture to have answers to these questions and that typically that there are sort of archetypes that a, a culture works with as far as like oh yeah the the young maiden the old widow the medicine woman the 
right? The wife, the mother, the, the slut, the whore. There are all these archetypes, and uh, Badu talks about in uh, his the true life. He talks about how um, for women, it's like the whole po- the whole the whole horizon of possibility has opened up because everyone knows that those old archetypes for women just don't work anymore. Um, so it's kind of like, it's kind of, it, it makes p- people go, oh, well, there's just possibilities then. But in the meantime, like, guys kind of require rites of passage. Like, guys need restraint. Guys need prohibition more than women. Guys need control more than women. Like, guys need to actually be turned into the little bitch by an actual society a little bit more than women do because, well, like just every teenage boy is a perfect example of why. It's like they, not every, but most, think that they're like these unlimited, like non-grounded, non-bodied, uh, limitless creatures, right? And women, because of their facticity, tend to have a sense of natural limits, uh, the real. And so, yeah, the, 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 cr- the crisis of not having... Um, these sort of like universally, intersubjectively o- agreed upon uh, rights to, to, to adulthood. It's not adulthood, it's manhood or womanhood. Um, that, that's a problem, and I think that just like every culture kind of comes up with solutions to it, right? I, I don't know how conscious it can be. That's part of the issue. Is I don't know how conscious we can actually ever be about coming up with these things because if you look at traditional societies, it, you got to wonder, did they really ever sit down and say, hey, let's decide what our system of gender is going to be. No, they, they're they living and they, they're in the world and this is what they came up with over time. Um, but I imagine that there are disputes over what is understood to make a person a man or make a person a woman um, and that these things are navigated by different cultures. And I think that plurality, if we want to live on, in a world where there is plurality, the the solution is not oh, everyone needs to agree with X, Y, or Z conceptions of gender, whether they're right or left. But instead, there needs to be a plurality of discourses about the fact that this is something cultures decide, right? And that for the most part, we kind of just need to respect people's experiments, whether that whether they be Amish or, or a polyamorous hippie commune. Like, you know, people going to experiment. Let them try to do something. But um, I, I, th- I hope that we've more or less have addressed it, Swole. I think he's pretty much happy. Um, there, there's a lot of questions we probably won't really get to. Um, but, you know, we've got a little bit of time left here. And there's a couple that I might bring in here in a moment if, um, if we'll have the time. But I, I just kind of want to turn things back over to all you guys. Say whatever you want. We... It's our stream. We can do whatever we want with it. Well, I do. I do think there might be something interesting here to to speak directly on the concept of sexual difference, or as I think Alenka prefers to use it, and I think as far as she's concerned, the way Lacan likes to use it is uh, the se- sexual division. Is that you know? So like, let me let me just engage a little bit with both the example that that Andrew Big Sig was giving with the basket and the arrow and the, and the structuralism and, and also what um, Dave was saying about every culture, like in, in a pluralistic, in a pluralistic society, we have to at least agree that, that cultures decide about sexual, different sexual division. And there's this experimentation. I think Alenka would agree that there is some social construction going on by cultures and there's this experimentation going on by cultures, but that the sexual division or the sexual difference as such is not culturally, it's not cultural or biological. That the sexual division is something that in some sense constitutes us as uh, well, that's that maybe it's just the location of the, the drive itself. That what's at stake, I think, for Alenka is seeing sexual division at the heart of each of us, as opposed to using sexual division to create um, an illusion of a harmonious relation. 
where the sexual division is in some sense outside of us. So like, for example, uh, she gives the example of traditional patriarchal societies where the woman has her place, right? It's like the sexual, like where the sexual, where the man has his place, woman has her place. She gives the example, like, like Zizek always critiques the du duality of yin and yang or the traditional duality of, of like mother earth and father sky. Like where woman has her place, man has his place, and they're and they're a balanced, harmonious two. Like Alenka, like Alenka is basically saying this is untenable in a psychoanalytic, in a post psychoanalytic point of view. That actually this division it, it cut it cuts along the heart of that's the drive. It cuts along the heart of each of us. And. And in a pluralistic society, in order to be a, a genuinely pluralistic society, I think we would at least need to recognize that singularity of, of the division as, as the division, the division as such, basically the split subject. Yeah, for sure. I'd like to kind of um, relate this back to dialectics and what we're doing as, as Zizekians, like what we what we believe would be the proper technique for understanding this impossible division. And when we say impossible, it's not like, Oh, something that can't happen. Impossible is like something that happens in a radical way because it's impossible. I know that sounds like kind of paradoxical and maybe we can go into that a little bit later, but actually I found a meme that was posted by a, a Delizian on uh, IG on Theorygram that I'd like to read because I think it's relevant and it would be interesting to also um, hear hear your response, all of your responses to this, not to hijack your role here, Dave, but I think it, it speaks to um, what, let's call them the other side, <laughs> thinks about uh, some of these issues. And I, I mean, the other side too, <clears throat> our Lacanian orientation, but uh, this person writes, unlike the supposed difference between man and woman, the difference between cis and trans is the difference between conforming to the system and acting in radical opposition to it. So a couple things there. Is that like totally off base? No, not at all. But it has to do with, Dave, when you were talking about parameters of, of possibilities, possibilities right and th th this idea that an exploration of gender identity um yes Cadell, i will hook you up with this uh an, ex an exploration and a, a kind of free play with these different um identity markers is what i call them or just uh, trying to um realize a certain what we think of as like you know innate psychic coordinates will lead to freedom, right? It lead to a freedom of possibilities. What we're in favor of when it comes to a dialectical approach is that the negation of the negation opens up a new field of understanding. What that means is that, is there a gender binary? Yes. Can it be oppressive? 100%. Um, does it? ruin people's lives i mean the enormous uh pressures placed on certain people in certain cultures to live up to a gender ideal absolutely but the idea is that the negation of the negation and this is not you know our classic misunderstood like fictian triad of thesis antithesis synthesis kind of thing the negation of the negation means that when we get back to the this idea of the binary, the binary itself, the bipolarity of gender, sex, whatever, can't be what it was initially. So we, the, the way to approach it is to make it so that what was seen as the original position, now I'm getting a little Hegelian here, but what was seen as the original position, the original affirmation, was already a movement away from it meaning to return to the binary, we want to problematize the binary, not by just saying, oh, it's confining, it reduces possibilities. 
but the binary itself can't be what it is. It isn't this singular reality. And I think that in a, in a way this should give ammunition to people um, who are trans or gender fluid or queer or whatever, in the sense that that means that this binary isn't as powerful as you think, because when you just say, let's break free from it, you uh, ascribe a certain um, strength to it that it doesn't have. Whereas when you uh, kind of undermine it from within, I think that you realize that it isn't what it is. And what that means is that you see where the, the real ideological mystification is contained there. It's not that like people have are in Plato's cave gender wise and, and need to be liberated and see the sun. That is the good. It's like, no, no, no. In thinking that the binary is this two, these two elements. And, and, and even if you're saying that's false, you're misrecognizing it. To quote, you know, Lorenzo Chiesa, the title of Lorenzo Chiesa, uh, Chiesa's book, it's a not to. That was fire, Nick. <laughs> and this, I, this is why I still think there's a use value in the distinction between sex and gender, you know, is because the, if the overwhelming majority of human beings the overwhelming majority are going to be XX and XY, you know, wombs and dick havers. It doesn't change the fact that that doesn't tell us, it does tell us certain things, right? And what it actually does tell us across cultures, that's interesting. Um, and that's obviously a, do a, a ripe domain of scientific research that gender theory doesn't get the last word on in every, in every case. But when it comes to how cultures deal with, uh, with sex and how human beings as individuals cope with being in sexuated bodies, right? And, and being like, oh, I'm a man? Okay, but also I don't feel like one. And I don't get along with the dudes the way that... The, I, nothing about their way of life works for me or has ever worked for me. Like... That's not something that, like, I, I just, uh, I, I, I think that conservatives are pretty, pretty willing at this point to just be like, oh, well, that's just a tomboy, or oh, that's just kind of a sissy boy, or you know, like that's, like, oh, okay, that's fine. Yeah, it's, it's still more complicated than that, though. Um, and so that's why I think, and, and even if it wasn't more complicated than that, it's still what they have just done is they've admitted to gender. That, that there are different ways that a person uh, can live in that body. There are different ways of responding to the facticity of being in that body, right? So I don't know. That's it's all interesting. And I, I, the, my, my questions earlier I had alluded to, Cadell, were all basically on the lines of you studied biology before you studied Hegel and Lacan. And... Um, I don't know if you were ever just a biology bro in like the more simplistic sense of like a, you had no theory and you thought biology basically answered everything. Um, but I am curious well, I was to hear from you. I was an anthropology. I was, I was in anthropology. I mean, I was in, I was in biological anthropology, but, but so I, I, I was, I was always my theory, my theory of the human, uh, was always biocultural. Okay. So I, I basically always, you know, implicitly, I always had a dialectic between sort of the natural givenness and our cultural constructive constructedness. And I always found it to be ridiculous when people I wouldn't use this language at the time, but I always found it ridiculous when people stepped out of a, a dialectic between the two. Mm. And and my my first my first paper, I don't know if you know this, my first paper was about the dialectical mediation of the biological and the cultural. Uh, it was, it's called the end of biological re reproduction, where I argue that there's a tension actually between the biological and the cultural, and that points towards the cultural. Um, but ultimately, I always viewed it in a dialectic. I see. Well, I I'd love to read that. 
still have a copy of that or like a PDF. Yeah. 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 There's a PDF. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And that's basically what you're saying you see now is that there's a breakdown. Like you, you basically have in the culture war people taking sides on something that is supposed to be dialectical. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, I, I, absolutely. It's the, the importance of the, the importance of dialectical thinking. I think what psychoanalysis adds, of course, is is the is the is the free association basically you got to say say whatever say whatever you want and and that's how alenka starts off what is sex by saying that the current psychoanalytic or the current psychotherapeutic um uh institutions um see it as um absurd or offensive if people free associate about sexuality that and this is i think uh building off of what uh, Andrew said earlier in the in the in the podcast, which is that it's not true that in our current liberal progressivist era we have no anxiety about sex. Just because we have an open, permissive sexuality, here's the crucial thing: is that both a closed, repressive, traditional sexuality like Victorian morals, and an open, permissive sexuality. There, neither of them are really dialectically mediating sexuality. And neither of them are really um, truly understanding the power of free association. Like now that's like, and, and that to me is, is, is the crucial thing. Like is, is that I don't know if there's some fundamental deadlock in the institutionalization of psychoanalysis like Lacan and maybe even... Zizek would say about Lacanian psychoanalysis today. But I think what we should really think of is, is just the power of the tool of free association as it relates to our own sexual neuroses. Like, I mean, I can, you know, that's maybe for a private conversation. <laughs> yeah, that's, no, that's good. Because, like, that's what psychotherapy does. And, like, you know, uh, transitioning from Jungian to pretty much soon I'll be going to a Lacanian, but like, I feel like most of psychotherapy and like psychodynamic psychoanalytic therapy, which is just watered down psychoanalysis. Ultimately there's this like pseudo Jungianism to it. And where it's like, okay. Uh, or like object relations and, and whatever. I'm not, I don't need to get into all that, but the point is, is that like, okay, there's a sexual problem. Even if you do talk about it, well, what that means is there, there's an underlying um, unconscious, uh, you know, instinct for, for love and nurturing and, and care or what it has to do is with the problem of really it's not sexual. It's that sexuality is, a, is, a, is rather a friction for your lack of existential meaning in the world. And it obfuscates really the potency and the importance of sexual division and uh sexuality in its ontological status um in the clinic and how it's constituted within our uh subjectivity right um you know and how uh chiesa points this out in uh subjectivity and otherness it's like it's like subjectivized lack that's what sexuality is you know the, this division, this lack, is subjectivized in us, and and it, it gets this deadlock in the unconscious. If we're good Lacanians, uh, gets brought about with reaching what would be called the fundamental fantasy, which is getting closer to the royal road of the unconscious. Not by saying, "Oh, you're talking about sexual fantasies. Uh, you need to see a sexologist," or, "Oh." This is actually exactly. a need for affection, you know, this this lack of affection that you got you didn't get from your mother, you know, you're projecting it out into your relationships because you seek comfort and you're not being recognized. So therefore it's like you're projecting and you're causing all these defenses to happen and you're using sex as an outlet. What the problem is is that you need to have a proper mirroring. Or in the Jungian sense, it's like, oh, you have, you know, sexual problems. It's like you're not transforming because libido is not sexual. It's all about transforming the psyche. It's a cauldron of instincts, and it's supposed to transubstantiate into the self. Like this archetypal complex of like, oh, the, 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 the pen or the nymph. It's like really it needs to maturate into the perfect child type thing. 
I, I, I just I have to side note. Andrew writing this piece that he's been working on, he just gets better and better at talking about basically comparative psychology. And um, I haven't actually, I don't think I've said this on stream, like, uh, except as a passing thing, but we, we, we were, the conversation with Andrew was the headlining event of this day two of the two day mar marathon stream. And just as it started, uh, or no, actually, the, no, right, right before it started, the, I lost the internet at my house. Like that was at the end of the call with one dime. So then I, I was, I spent like a half hour trying to restart the router and get it to work, but it wasn't working. And then I had to go to a coffee shop in the middle of the night. Um, and we actually got the interview, but because I was doing it on my laptop where I can't record and stream at the same time because it. I mean, I, I, my computer almost shuts down just from streaming, so I can't do streaming and recording at the same time. Um, it all got lost, and I didn't even know that it would get lost because, but basically, if I found out the hard way that if you stream for longer than 12 hours, you'll lose everything after the 12 hour mark. So, anyway, Andrew uh, blew our minds. It was an amazing talk that he gave, um, and we're looking to have it again in a week or two. Is it, that's right. Yeah. In a week or two. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And okay. uh, definitely it's going to be a better conversation than the first. Cause like just really formulating those ideas and um, even kind of elaborating on them in here in a certain way. I mean, I don't really talk too much about Jung and psychotherapy. It's just more of the fact that like, I'm talking about what's called therapism as like, as a whole, as a sort of ideology that like tries to fundamentally retrace the error of what's happening with capitalist ideology, right? It's a super ego injunction to enjoy, enjoy yourself, be healthy in a indifferent world, uh, be whole, be authentic, right? This, this demand to be different, be unique, right? Set the standard in right. a, a therapeutic sense is well, it's capitalized by capitalist ideology, but it also tries to mediate against the failures that capitalism is putting onto us as interpolated subjects. So, you know, I definitely point in the essay a lot of Zizek at, when I get into the ideological aspect um, and Althusser as well. Some of the failures that Althusser doesn't account for like failed interpolation and subjectivization, but mainly as far as the psychoanalytic critique, because it's broken down into the psychoanalytic and the ideological critique, it's that it doesn't get at the heart of pretty much um, the unconscious, which is going to be sexuality and the traumatic aspect. I only focus on trauma, not sexuality in this essay, uh, but the trauma is something that, you know, as uh, someone told me in a comment, which I thought was really helpful, it makes me need, uh, have to pretty much have to read Mario Rudy, but like something that I already knew from the Lacanian aspect, but just to emphasize that trauma is constitutive to our very, essence of being in the world you know as split subjects versus a circumstantial event um that is kind of uh forced upon us right and like just to, to kind of cap it off because i don't want to go off into too tangent and uh, too much of a tangent and get us off topic but for example like gabor mate everybody's favorite who i critique in the essay talks about like trauma as and he gets close, but he fails. He's like, it's not about the event that happens, but it's how you internalize it. But then he goes so far as to like talk about like addiction. And it's like, well, you know, you fell into addiction because you didn't feel like you belonged in the world. You were cut off from being comforted, from being your authentic self. And then like, therefore, you try to cope by going to addictive substances to hide the traumatic feeling of not belonging or like with addiction he talks about like the, you know you have two brothers uh that are you know sons of a of an alcoholic father one never touches alcohol and the other one does right so right there he's he already like is bringing up the problem of trauma but he doesn't go far enough because he doesn't talk about how really with the psychoanalytic one is it's constitutive and not an event type thing excellent excellent Really quick point of order, everybody. We're going to close this thing out in the next 20 minutes, but I do want to say I had made a promise. Um, if you are in the What is Sex course and want to hop on here, just shoot me a DM on Theory Underground. I'll get you the link so you can pop in 
and ask a question direct. It's something that we've been doing in the last few months on the channel, making it so the people who want to, you know, like treat it almost like a call-in TV show, but you get to pop in. I know Jordan is in the chat. Um, no Nance today. It's like, that's a first, maybe. Um, but, yeah, if you're in the course and you want to pop in, ask a question, pop in. Yeah, what is, what is sex begins on May 7th, as Cadell just said in the live chat side of things, which is in two days from now. Woo! One, one day for me. And uh, Cadell, you just published a piece about it. Could, I haven't read it yet. I'm just curious. Um, sure. uh, you've, you've written two pieces, and I'm just wondering. I've written three, I think. Yeah, three. Oh, my God. Okay, well, what would you say uh, are the three pieces? Uh, you know, basically a teaser of you wrote three pieces, and it, whatever your teaser is should give me a sense of, well, one of them sure. might be more interesting to me, and I should maybe start with one as opposed to another. I don't know. Okay, so I, I wrote uh, binary, non-binary, and singular negativity. And that piece is basically trying to problematize both the emphasis on the strong binary, like, you know, uh, I think Nick's already said, like, the binary isn't as strong as as people give it credit for. It's like, so there's problematizing the strong binary, also problematizing the emphasis on the non-binary, which to me is an emphasis on the multiplicity. And I think what both binary and non-binary set up is kind of like a meta-binary you know, like where where like the trad binaries go against the non-binary multiplicity. And there's a culture war about that. And what I'm trying to emphasize is that both the binary and the non-binary are unified by the singular negativity. And that all identities share a singular negativity. And that's actually what unifies us. And that's actually a dis like if we could work towards a discourse of the singular negativity. That would un that would to me in principle unify the the progressive woke and the conservative um, trad um, and in a non um, in a non sort of naive way. Then I have a paper called uh, the Onto Epistemological Short Short Circuit, and that's basically introducing the importance of just what I was talking about earlier about um, the tendency to an epistemological viewpoint disconnected from ontology an ontological viewpoint disconnected from epistemology. This is this is throughout philosophy and thinking the two of them together through what Alenka calls the, sh the short circuit actually is uh, a really powerful metaphor that structures all of what is sex. And to me, ultimately, what's at stake in Alenka's short circuit is the opposite of Deleuze's open flows of desire. Instead of Deleuze's open flows of desire, where to ultimately I conclude that, that Deleuze cannot think the mediation of sexuality, he only thinks the immediacy of sexuality. And what Alenka allows us to do through the singular negativity, through the short circuit, is mediate sexuality through our relation to the non-relation. And then finally, I just wrote a piece today inspired by the first chapter called It's Getting Strange in Here. And uh, long story short, I try to uh, situate the first chapter of what is sex in relationship to the history of the countercultural revolution. I see the countercultural revolution of the 1960s as basically a relationship between um, primal, like two different mega cultural shifts, tectonic shifts in regards to primal repression. You have Christianity. Which, which obfuscates primal repression with the ban on natural sexuality. And then you have the counterculture of the 1960s, which is also uh, banning, uh, obfuscating primal repression by just making it a site of pure affirmation. Like, let's just purely affirm sexuality at the site of primal. No, that will just, that and that eats, and that becomes its own paradox in the institutionalization of the 1960s counterculture in the institutionalization of the 1960s counterculture it starts to yeah marcus bro it starts to eat itself so 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 anyway so these are the three articles i'll 
I'll leave them in the in the um, the YouTube chat. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, we'll share those in the maybe also like a comment in the comment section as well. Um, that's excellent. I'm really I'm I'm stoked you wrote three pieces on that. That's really cool. Yeah. Um. Maybe after I've gone over this this book a couple of times, like I'm I'm already working on a piece, um, and it's basically just a piece called "What Does Alenka Zupancic Mean by Sex and Why Should We Care?" Right? It's like a very basic um, piece that I I want to I want to try to model her her style, which is to say, I'm gonna keep writing and writing and cutting and cutting and cutting, you know, because that's what she's really good at is just honing it down to something really succinct. But um, yeah, uh, I, I think what we're going to do here is close out in a couple minutes here. I want to give everybody a chance to plug their shit, though. So um, look, everybody, this, this is a mashup, obviously, with the Young Jijikians and Cadell Last in this conversation. The Young Jijikians is a loosely associated, only halfway tongue-in-cheek uh, group that is not a group, right? We're like just a... Uh, just an underground rap duo that never even made an LP, but we've got a couple of epic streams, you know, and then we've, and we've got a little, we've got some theory gram clout and, uh, obviously people love to see us talk. Um, and on the tour this, this fall, we're going to do some real life shit and it's going to be awesome. But, uh, the stuff we do with Cadell, it's all experimental. It's all very new. Um, philosophy portal is young. Theory Underground is way younger, and um, I I just believe in working with other people who are kind of doing this shit. It's just like it, we're out here, and uh, we're we're caught in that contradiction between wanting to just put it all out there on the internet for free, but also wanting to add value to this and show people that you really can have something that goes far beyond the experience, the best of your experiences at the university outside of the university and not for credit in a classroom with people who are all there for the right reasons ostensibly, right? Like the, the idea that we can do this just because we want to, right? Um, I like how Cadell said that doing underground shit is doing what you love with people you love, right? Um, it's more than that. We're all figuring out what it is as, as more than that, but at least at the very baseline, that is what it is. And uh, I love doing this stuff with you guys, and so I really appreciate you all for coming on. How about you all take a moment to plug your shit here? I wanted to just, um, <clears throat> I will plug my shit, but I wanted to read this quote from What is Sex? And who knows, maybe we'll get some more people to sign up for the course because of this quote, just because it's, when I first read it, it stood out to me. And it's so, as you, as you were describing, Dave, like her succinctness comes through so well here. Um, I'll just read it. <clears throat> she says, the speaking being is neither part of organic nature, nor its exception, nor something in between, but it's real, the point of its own impossibility, impasse. The speaking being is the real existence of an ontological impasse. So what is at stake is not that man is distinguished by the declination from nature and its laws. Man is not an exception constituting the whole of the rest of nature, but the point at which nature exists only through the inclusion of its own impossibility. To me, that's just mwah, so good. Um, plugging my shit. Me and Andrew are going to be coming out with what we call new season, right? Of uh, what was formerly known as K-Voy, Vanishing Mediators. We've been on hiatus for a while, writing our essays. You know, we're always working on something. We... Desperately want to finish up seminar two and get into three, change the structure of the episodes a little bit and um, take on some other works, do some exegetical readings. We're really excited for what's on the horizon. And um, 
yeah, just hope to get um, more more eyeballs on what we're doing. That's about all I have. Hey, Nick, um, thank you. I, I think, did you already tell people you lost your voice because you're reading Pinocchio with too much uh, enthusiasm? But I just wanted to say, I, I the idea of you being like, I'm a real boy, to a classroom of little kids only in Italian is, it just makes me so happy. And it's I wish it. for... I mostly speak English. They're too, they're too young. They, it, it's, it's mostly English, yeah. I've heard them in voice messages when we're talking and they're all like running by you and they, they, they speak to you in Italian. So they know, they all know one word and that's buongiorno. So they all oh, say okay. buongiorno, but <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't taught them much beyond that, but they seem to enjoy it. Cool. Andrew. Uh, yeah. Uh, plug my shit. So pretty much. Yeah. Like, you know, this is definitely a great text to read um, to not only, like, get out of the horizon of, like, you know, traditional continental philosophy as we know it, but also for those who are interested into uh, understanding the basic concepts of psychoanalysis and why sexuality is important and why it, it's still important and why it was such a big emphasis on Freud. To kind of recap what we said in the beginning but, you know, like Nick said, we got a lot of stuff that, you know, us two are working on. Um, and, you know, just that this this pretty much is a work that needs to be uh, tarried with. You know, sexuality is at the heart of identity and its failures. And, you know, if you have not read this book, and you have no right to speak <laughs> about these issues. But other than that, enjoy your symptom. <laughs> oh, I will say, as Lacan says, uh, to, to kind of quilt it off, um, you know, the event of a good fuck does not in one way refute the idea that there is no sexual relation. So keep that in mind. <laughs> 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 Fantastic. All, all I got to say is that our, our course, What is Sex Starts, May 7th. I'm super excited for this first collaboration. I love the spirit that uh, is embodied by Theory Underground and, and, and uh, by, what, by what you're doing, Dave. And just super excited to, to, to do this first experiment. Um, I'm extremely, um, I guess, optimistic about... The next two months, I think that it's going to be the most thorough investigation of this text ever conducted, because I don't think it's not it's not a very old text. And I don't think anyone's really investigated on this level. And a link is going to be there. So this is a super event and I'm just uh, just looking forward to it. So come along for the ride. Uh, sign up at Theory Underground or Philosophy Portal, and uh, let's uh, let's let's do this. Absolutely, everybody, especially if you are interested in um, studying Lacan's The Accree this summer. There's nobody else on the internet tackling that in a way that where you could do it as well outside of Philosophy Portal, and so that's something that's coming. It's going to kick off July fifteenth. And the What is Sex course is a sort of primer for it. And so um, it's a really cool approach there. Um, if you are going to look at it at the Theory Underground site, theory-underground.com forward slash courses forward slash what dash is dot sec or dash sex. If you were to type that in um, and then you were to say, oh, I want to take this and then you were adding the product and all of this. There's tiers, there's tiers. Levels of access. Um, the first level is just basically auditing the course. The second level is longer term buy-in to the site. And the third one is where you're really just getting my time and energy um, on lock. Like if you want comprehensive, constructive feedback from me, that's the way to get it is with tier three. And tier four will get you some one-on-one -on -one sessions where we talk about 
your, your writing reflections and your final project. So I, I, I like the idea of adding, um, if, if you want that extra one-on-one, -on -one, um, then just pay for it. And, I, and, and kind of separating them out that way with the tiered system makes a lot of sense actually because at the university one of the most frustrating things was trying to give the same kind of attention to everybody trying to give everybody comprehensive constructive feedback never really knowing who really wants it and who's really going to benefit from it and then finding out later like a lot of people who seem like they're there for it they actually don't even seem to engage with it they don't actually take it seriously and then you know find out later one of the people who seem completely not interested in things was actually super there for the constructive feedback. And so if you know that you're the kind of person who benefits from that, search it out. That's all I got to say about that. I know that Cadell has similar tiers available with all of the stuff that he does as well. So um, there's, there's levels to this shit. There's, there's levels. levels there's levels to this shit. Thank you, everybody, in the live chat for keeping it civil, um, but also interesting, more importantly. And I don't know if it's more important, but thank you for, for doing both. And uh, people in the future, make sure to leave some kind of a comment below. And we'll catch you all on the flip side. Peace. Is it working? <laughs>
starting in May. If you sign up at Tier 3, you also get access to the Recovery Group component, which also meets once per month. Enroll with promo code CMTEARLYBIRDYT before May 13th for 20% off. If you are frustrated by the discourse revolving around gender ideology, left and right, then join us in thinking deeper about sex. Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal is joining up with Theory Underground to teach Alenka Zupanchik's What is Sex? one of the most succinct and cutting-edge works of theory dealing with the topic. Zupanchik is one of the Slovenian circle's most incisive critics of both naive progressivism and reactionary tendencies when it comes to thinking about the relationship between sex, culture, and subjectivity. If interested, watch Three Reasons to Read What is Sex, which will be shared on screen at the end of this video. What is Sex begins in May and goes through June, meeting for four lecture sessions and, surprise, you will actually get to meet Alenka Zupanchik herself. Use promo code WHATISSEXEARLYBIRDYT before May 7th for 20% off. And just so you know, everybody, don't stress the capitalization. I just make it that way so it's more readable. It's not case sensitive. Being in time is one of the most notorious, profound, and difficult works of philosophy from the last 200 years. Its deconstruction of modernity and fundamental challenge to scientism is a prerequisite rite of passage for any thinker who wants to seriously engage with continental philosophy, social theory, or world change. In this course, you will learn about what Heidegger means by being, being in the world, Dasein, being unto death, and so many other crucial developments. But more important than all these buzzwords is just taking on this work itself and wrestling with the text. Doing so will rapidly accelerate your reading comprehension abilities and simultaneously challenge some of your most deep-seated presuppositions. As before, an introductory video to this course is shared on the end screen of this video or can be accessed from the links in the description. Being in Time Division 1 starts in June and ends July 22nd. Division 2 begins August 19th and goes through October. To sign up for Division 1 today, use the promo code BEINGINTIMEEARLYBIRDYT before the end of May for 20% off. If you feel obstructed by the cost of these courses, then we have good news. But before getting into the financial aid info, why are there even price tags at all, much less tiered pricing? First, because some people just want to audit, whereas others want constructive critical feedback or even one-on-one -on -one sessions. The tiers exist so that you can get the value you are seeking while compensating me, Dave, fairly for the time and energy required. Second, the prices set for these courses aim to make Theory Underground sustainable, meaning that it will bring in enough to pay for the costs of the operation, including my personal bills since I want to be a co-earner in the household when my soon-to-be wife and I start a family. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> Thirdly, People tend to take the things they pay for more seriously, and we want you to get the most out of this experience. With those reasons aside, we do not seek to exclude anyone who is struggling just to get by. We have a financial aid scholarship option for people who are currently between jobs or who live in a country on a cheap currency, like many of you who watch from Thailand, India, Mexico, or Poland. To name a few of the residents of some of the people who have already received financial aid scholarships in the last couple of months. Because I know what trying to study theory under the stresses of housing insecurity and poverty is like, the scholarship was set up during the first month of operation. Simply fill it out at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash scholarship. Last but not least, stay tuned for the Theory Underground app coming soon to an app store near you on your phone. Yeah, and seriously, thank you for listening or watching to this point. And uh, yeah. Thanks. We look forward to taking these courses with you. Bye.